Shabbat Shalom, everyone. This is the light of Torah, purity of truth ministries. And we are blessed by our creators, our father, Yehovah, and our savior, Yehoshua, that we can assemble and that we have the opportunity to hear from them the blessings of the scriptures, though, to understand and to learn and to study, to show ourselves approved, and all of that that Yah commands so that we can have his mind, the mind through the spirit, because he gives us of the spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, so that we can have our eyes open, have our ears unstopped, and so that we can have the opportunity to live by every word that proceeds from our creators. So let us pray now as we offer up ourselves before the Most High. Heavenly Father, we present ourselves. What a blessing that is before your throne of mercy and grace and that you have given us the hope, the hope in your son, though. You've given us the opportunity to be called and chosen by you. But our part is to be faithful, faithful in the keeping, in the working of your word, so that we, Father, can become just like you. We need to build and grow in righteous character, the righteousness that comes from you. And that's what you have called us for, to be the first fruits so that the rest of mankind eventually will have their opportunity. So we're asking you now for your blessing as we have this part six in this series, and we're asking your blessing by the Spirit. And help us, Father, do not be distracted or hindered by any, about anything, but help us to be focused on your way of life. In the name of our Savior and soon coming King Yahusha, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn your mic on. Turn your mic on. Turn your mic on one more time. Sure. Excuse me for a moment. All right, testing, testing. Yeah. Is it on? See? It is on. It is on. All right. So I can't I can't use the hand, hand mic. Yes. So everyone that will join us today, uh, we had some technical difficulties, but we're about to start uh, this part six. And I'd like to give you the title for part six. And this is the title. <clears throat> and this is an extension for what we studied last Sabbath anyway. Hadassah, that's in Esther, uh, the book of Esther. Her Hebrew name is Hadassah. Hadassah pictures the hidden virgin for our king's deliverance of his people. Let me repeat that. Hadassah. And Hadassah is spelled H A D A S. S-A-H. So it pictures the hidden vision for our king's deliverance of his people. So once again, this is part six. And the leading scripture is Esther chapter four. That's the foundation scripture for this study. We're starting in Esther four. We're going through some other scriptures in Esther, but Esther chapter four. And we're going to read, as we did even last Shabbat, Verse 13 and 14. 13 and 14. So let us begin. Verse 13 now in Esther chapter 4. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. And here's what he said Think not with yourself that you shall escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Verse 14, for if you all together hold your peace, and you know, you're still about the matter, at this time, then shall there an enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows? whether you are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And so I'm going to break down some of these words and give you some definitions. The word escape in verse 13. The word escape is number 4422 in the Hebrew. 4422 and it's malat. 
M-A-L-A-T, malat. Notice the definition. To flee for one's life. This is what the word escape, now we're defining. To flee for one's life, to release, also to deliver, and to give birth. Isn't that interesting? To give birth now. So when it says escape in the king's house, the word house in Hebrew, we've studied it many a times, is number 1004. In the Hebrew, word for house. And it's bayith, B-A-Y-I-T-H, B-A-Y-I-T-H. And its meaning is family. Don't forget, we're talking about the king's house. Family. Its root word is 1129 in the Hebrew. And that's bana, B-A-N-A-H. So that's 1129, the root word. And it means to build. So here you got a meaning about the king's house and having to do with family, having to do with to build, all right? So this picture, this is a picture of Yah's assembly. Yah's assembly that had to be built. In fact, the Messiah referred to that in Matthew 16. Let's turn there, hold your place, keep a marker in Esther itself, but let's turn to Matt and Yahoo and Matthew 16. We've studied this scripture numerous times, but it's important meanings here of what we are studying today. So Matthew 16, and we're going to look at verse 18. So the Messiah is speaking, and he says this in verse 18, and I say also to you, now he's speaking to Simon, I say also to you that you are Peter, that's the English though, and upon this rock I will build. See, that's the family, the assembly. I will build my, and it says church was the ecclesia, the called out ones, the assembly. He's talking about that. I will build, he says. The Messiah says that, said this. And it says, and the gates of hell of Hades shall not prevail against it. So look at the, the word for Peter. I'm going to look that up right now. And he, he mentioned Peter as a name, or I'm sorry, as a title. And uh, you know what? Uh, let me think if I want to cover that at this moment. Yes. Okay. Hold on. I'm looking at something in my notes that I may have skipped. All right, I guess we need to come back. We'll, we'll come back temporarily for that explanation. But uh, let's go back to Esther. Going back to Esther, let me follow my notes. Go back to Esther in verse 14, Esther 4, verse 14, because I want to define the ne that next word, which is enlargement. Enlargement. And that is 7305 in the Hebrew. 7305 and Rewa, and Rewa is spelled R E W A H. R E W A H, the Hebrew word. Now, this is defined this way the word enlargement now, it means relief, liberation. Think about that liberation and deliverance. So it also has the meaning of deliverance, but re to, to relieve or relief, liberation and deliverance. And then it says, and deliverance itself. So this is another Hebrew word. The word deliverance itself is, we studied last Sabbath, 2020. If you remember that number, 2020. And it's Hatzalah, Hatzalah. It's a long Hebrew word. Hatzalah is spelled this way, H A T. S T S A L A H. Let me repeat that. Hatsala. H A T S T S A L A H. The number 2024, the word deliverance now. And it means rescue. And its root, it says, it gives a root word, is 
5337, which you know this, 5337, is the Hebrew word Natsal. And obviously that's important to us because Natsal is what Shaul would have spoke in the Hebrew when he was referring to being caught up. For the people of Yah, the first fruits to be caught up, where we had the, the uh, Greek word harpazo, which was translated into the Latin repari, and that repari is the Latin that we get the English word rapture. So now that was taught by the Apostle Shaul, but like I said, if he was speaking in his, which he was, actually he was speaking in his Hebrew language, he was using the term natsal himself. So he wasn't speaking Greek harpazo, and he wasn't speaking Latin repari. He was speaking his own native language. So once again, natsal though, which is the root word for deliverance that we're studying 2020 in uh, verse 14. Natsal is to snatch away. Look at that. Think. Snatch away. Escape. Take out. Think about that term. Taking out of where? Take out. Preserve. And save like a salvation, but save. So once again, we are studying this word deliverance in verse 14, having to do with a picture of the rapture. That's what this account in Esther, it's a picture of the rapture. For who though? For his assembly. Remember the house, the king's house, the father's house. Think of that in that term. So remember what it was in the story of, of Esther that we've been studying. And it had to do with when we look at, let's see, chapter uh, two. So we're in Esther now, chapter two. And as we are looking at chapter two, it was uh, in verse one, starting in verse one. So Esther two, verse one says this. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. She was removed, okay? She was a disobedient queen and she defamed and dishonored and disrespected the king. So verse 2 says this, Then said the king's servants that ministered to him, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom. Now, I'm going to stop there just for a second. In chapter 1, just to relate this, how many provinces there were. In verse 1, Esther 1, verse 1, it speaks of, Ahusuerus, who reigned, it says, from India even to Ethiopia. And then it says, over 107 and 20 provinces. So 127. That's a lot of provinces. Okay. So now they're seeking through his ministers to seek out virgins from all the 127. So you at least have 127 virgins being sought out, maybe representing each uh, province. So, continuing, we're in uh, chapter 2, of course. Um, and uh, let's see, continuing where I left off, let's see. Okay. So, they were seeking virgins, though. And so, uh, I have a reference when it says the virgins, hold your place. In chapter 2, and let's turn to Matthew 25. Well, you, you definitely know this verse. Matthew 25. And once again, it relates to what the Messiah was teaching in chapter 25. And we're looking at uh, verse, let's see, um, uh, 10. I'm sorry, 1. And then 1 and 10. It says in verse 1, Matthew 25, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to 10 virgins. See that? which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now verse 10. And it goes on to say, and while they went to buy, 
that is to seek, to have righteous character, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready, though, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So they that were ready was only the five that were wise. The five foolish were left out, because it says in verse 11, after came afterward came also the other virgin, saying, well, Lord, Lord, open to us. Verse 12, but he answered and said, truly, I say to you, I know you not. So now let's go back to Esther again. Chapter 2, where we left off. So we're, now we're going to look at, uh, let's see. Um, well, you know what? I need to also cover Revelation 14. Sorry about that. Yes, we're going back to chapter 2 of uh, Esther, but Revelation 14, because this is all pertaining to the virgins. This is an important verse to read, obviously, but verse 3, Revelation 14, verse 3 says, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts, which means living creatures, and the elders. And no man, or should be no one, could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. You understand? Removed from the earth. Think about that. All right. These are, it says 144,000 though. These, verse 4, are they which were not defiled with women. This is symbolism of false religious systems because women is equated with that in the scriptures and prophecies in the female gender. With women, for they are, see, the ones that are to be redeemed, they are virgins. Look at that, spiritually in your sight. Virgins. These are they, how are they virgins? Who follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes. These were redeemed. So describing who were redeemed from the earth, they are virgins who follow them. That's the key. They were redeemed from among men. And that term man in the Greek means mankind. So they were removed from mankind. It says being the first fruits though to Elohim and to the lamb, the father and the son, first fruits. So we got to understand what Yah's plan what is and is all about and preparing a bride for the bridegroom. That's why we read Matthew 25. Now back to Esther chapter two. And once again, as we continue studying this important message, important under teaching. Okay, so let's skip to verse 7 of this chapter. So now it's talking about Mordecai. And it says in verse 7, and he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther. So when you look up definitions and whether it's concordance, whether you look up in other sources, it's not always when you see a name or a word that it comes from the Hebrew or even the Greek. Many times it comes from other you know, languages, such as this, Esther is a Persian name. It literally means a star. You see, because in the Persian empire, as other, other nations of the world, they worship the host of heaven. So they had their way of, of, of worship. And so her name meant a star. And it says his uncle's daughter. So they were cousins, actually. But he put himself in a position as a father. So he was, wasn't just a cousin. He was a father to her. All right? Because her parents were deceased, as it says here. And it says in verse 7, and she had neither father nor mother. You understand? And the maid was fair and beautiful. Whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So it doesn't always have to be a biological direct parents that raise children. Whoever puts themselves in the position. To be a parent over a child, Yah defines that as the true and real parent. It's not always biological, and that's taught throughout the scriptures. So let's continue. 
like I said, Esther is a Persian name for a star. And I have here, uh, but her Hebrew name was Hadassah. H-A-D-A-S-S-A-H. And that is number 1919 in the Hebrew, 1919. Literally, it means a myrtle tree. A myrtle tree. So why is it that this life, this being, this female would be named after a myrtle tree? Think about that. Because in the Hebrew culture, they named their children based on perhaps a destiny. It wasn't just perhaps, it was a destiny. If you gave the right name. And that's why human beings have to be very careful what they name their children. It's not about the sound, how it sounds together. It's very, un to be understood, the meaning behind that. And the meaning behind that is important as far as the relationship with the creators, the meaning. So a myrtle tree? So let's understand what that meant and what that pictures. Myrtle tree. It pictures life and fertility. Think about that life. When you think about life, our existence, not only in the physical realm, but into eternity. And fertility has to do with procreation. So her name was intended to be used, she to be used to be an example in directing people toward life and also the procreation of the family. The procreation of the family. That's the picture. We're studying about Hadassah and the matters of what it what her name pictures. Now I've got a, a printout but I wrote the notes here from the printout in my uh, notes right here. It also has the meaning of, uh, I'm talking about the myrtle tree now. It's from the eucalyptus, eucalyptus family. The eucalyptus family, which has stiff, think about that, stiff, leathery. It's stiff and leathery. And it, uh, it's in, in other words, its leaves, its leaves are stiff and leathery that stay green year round. Isn't that interesting? It stays green year round. Whereas most, you know, what, what most trees that have leaves, what happens to them? They have a glory, they have a beauty, and then they begin to diminish and fade away. And it pictures the death of those leaves because that's why we have the term, the fall time of the year, when the leaves fall down, but not with the myrtle tree. It stays green all year round. That's very interesting what it pictures. It means a strong tree with a pleasant smell. A strong tree with a pleasant smell. It is also the myrtle tree now with the leaves known that when it's chopped down, when it's chopped down, will grow back stronger. Isn't that interesting? When it's chopped down, it will grow back stronger. Well, right away, you know how it works. Yah gave me the scripture in John 15. Hold your place and let's turn to John 15 now. Johanna or John 15 in the gospel there. Look what the Messiah was teaching. The Messiah is teaching this, not me. John 15 verse 2 says this. Well, first of all, in verse 1 for context, I am the true vine, he says of himself, and my father is the husbandman. Now, verse 2, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Who takes away? The Father. You understand? And then it says, but here's the key. Every branch that bears the fruit, though, he purges it. He cuts it back. That's what the word purge means. That it may bring forth more fruit. Stronger. You understand? Better. 
so to speak. So that's the picture then of the myrtle tree. It's a branch to bring forth more fruits. So now back to Esther chapter two. Esther chapter two. And we're going to look at verse 10. So we were in verse 7. And by the way, uh, Mordecai was also of the captivity. And Mordecai actually is a Persian, also a Persian Babylonian name. Even though he was uh, in his background, he was of. Uh, of the son of Kish in his background, and who was also uh, in the heritage, a background of the son of Kish. It was King Saul. So whatever his Hebrew name was meant to be, he was born in that captivity during that time. And therefore he had a Persian Babylonian name, Mordecai. And when I was doing my research on that, uh, Many of the people of Israel adopted or took on the names of their of their culture in captivity, and is usually many many times connected with a pagan deity, just like Esther, the pagan deity of the star. Well, this like man of Mordecai was with Marduk. You see, a pagan deity of Babylon. So just keep that in mind. Names. All right, so, but he didn't conduct himself like a Persian or a Babylonian. As you see, what his example is when we read the account about him, how he conducted himself. And that's why he was sought by Haman to be hung, to be killed. All right, so now we're gaining understanding as we go along. And verse 10, I was referring to in this chapter. So it says here, Esther, verse 10, chapter 2, Esther, it says, had not shown her people nor her kindred. In other words, who she was. She had not shown. For Mordecai had charged her. That's a command that she should not show. You understand? Who she really was. She came from a province. She was a Jew. But she was not to show who she was. So as I have here in the, about this verse, she was obedient. That's the picture. She was obedient to her father. You understand? She was obedient to her father as he commanded her, it says in that verse, to not reveal her background. You understand? Her background identity. To not reveal it. So let's go ahead to verse 17. Now we're talking here in verse 17 about Ahusuerus, his love for Esther. And it says the king loved Esther above, you see that? All the women, at least 127, including her, all right? All the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight. Look what it says. More than all the virgins. It's just like what we read in Matthew 25 about the five and five, but the five versions that had the grace and the favor of the most high more than the other five, you see. So think of it that way as well. So more than all the versions, verse 17, so that, this is the rest of the verse, verse 17, so that he set the royal crown upon her head. So that means 126 were rejected. At least 126. And, you know, since the scriptures has a lot to do with numbers and meanings and pictures, I'll just say this. The number 26 divided by three is 42 three times. Like reading a prophecy about the uh, 42 months as an example. And that means it has a certain symbolism to that, but I, I'm not, you know, my purpose is not to go into that. <laughs> But so 126 were rejected for one, one, and made her queen instead of Vashti, as it says in verse 17. So let's continue. She was loved 
by the king, as we already read, more than all the women or virgins. And she was made queen in, as a replacement, though, of Vashti. So now let's look at verse 20. It says, Esther had not yet, once again, shown her kindred, nor her people. So he repeats it a second time. Nor her people, as Mordecai had charged her. See that? For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai. That's symbolic of what the assembly is supposed, what Yah is looking for in every assembly. Amongst all his people, you know, whether we're going to keep his commandments or not and follow. And she did it that way. She followed the commandment. It mentions this for the second time. Like as when she was brought up with him. So it wasn't just about that instruction or commandment as she was being brought up with him. Other commandments, she was an obedient girl or an obedient child. That was her example. That's what I'm trying to get us all to see and understand about this wonderful example of this woman that was called from the womb. Called from the womb. So um, as I'm reading this here, while she was still obedient to her father's commandment, this is another picture, though. Another picture, hold your place in Revelation 3. Revelation 3. I write it as God gives it to me. Revelation 3. How many times we read this set of verses? What Yah is looking for in every individual that he draws to his son, male or female. But Revelation 3 verse 8 says this. You know these verses. I know your works. The Messiah is speaking. Our Savior, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door and no one, says man, no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. Hadassah's name means strength. Part of the meaning. Strength, and you have kept. Look at this, my word. Just like she obeyed, was obedient to Mordecai in her upbringing. Besides, to not disclose her identity, the commandment of her father. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. Look at that, verse nine. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not. But do lie, they're liars. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet. So anytime you had royalty, it was like a worship. At the feet of, the, uh, of a king or at the feet of a queen. I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. That's the picture. Just like Herusarus loved Esther. Or Hadassah more than all the other women? Yah is showing his fulfillment that he loves this particular assembly more than the rest. That's why they are where they are. More than the rest. You understand? Think about what's being disclosed here. More than the rest. I have loved you. It says in verse 10, because why? You have kept the word of my patience. It takes patience. And do, to be in obedience and sometimes to suffer for it. I also will keep you from the hour or time of trial. You see, it's talking about the tribulation. I will keep you from it, which shall come upon all the world. No place to hide. All the world to try or to test them that dwell upon the earth. So there's a separation of this particular assembly from all the rest. From all the rest. And that was verse 10. How far did I need? Okay, two more. Behold, I come quickly. So it's in the time of the end. This prophecy about the last days. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which you have. That no, it says, man, it should be no one. Take your crown. And you know what? If Esther or Hadassah was not obedient, her crown would have been removed just like, just like Vashti. Just like Vashti. So she, it's intended for this assembly to have a special crown, a particular, specific crown. Verse 12, so him or them 
that overcome, it should be in out of the Greek. When I studied this, it's not just him, it's them that overcome will, because it's male and female. It's not just the male gender, male and female. Them that overcome, though, will I make a pillar in the temple of my Yah. You see, that's the house. And he shall go, or she, or they shall go no more out. And I will write upon, I should be them, the name of my Yah, or Elohim. And the name of the city of my Elohim. Just like you own a house, your name is attached to the house. Physically speaking, when you're a homeowner, so to speak. The name of the city of my Yah, which is new or renewed Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my Elohim, the, meaning the Father. That's Revelation 21. And I will write upon him my new name as the husband. He's the husband of the bride who becomes the wife and the queen. Just like Esther. Just like Adasa. You understand? So that's why he gave me that set of scriptures. Let's go back now. Let's go back. And um, so once again, yeah, it, this was a description that, you, that the Messiah gave of his assembly, a particular specific assembly, as a virgin bride. As a virgin bride. So now back to Esther chapter 4 this time. Going back to chapter 4. And now let's look at verse 16. So here's what the instruction was. From uh, Esther. Or Hadassah. Go gather together all the Jews. She's giving it to her father now. Instruction that are present in Shushan, and fast you for me. Look who she says. We'll look at the instruction. And neither eat nor drink three days. That's the true fast. Not other types of fastings that we have been um, shown that many of the religions practice, which is not the kind of fasting that Yah designates. Eat nor drink three days. It says night or day. You know, not just have a, a you know a partial day of fast the whole day. Well, you can have a partial leading up to a full day, but night or day for three days. Look at this example. I also though she's not just telling her, you know, her uh, cousin father Mordecai for all the Jews to do this. She's also going to be participating, participating. I also, it says, will fast likewise. So, Yah gave me this other verse. And, um, well, let me re read the rest of this. Likewise. Well, okay, no, I'll stop at that point. I'm coming back to that verse. Uh, so, she was willing, here's my notes. She was willing to humble herself. You understand? In fasting and prayer. And sacrifice her life. For her people. Because as the rest of this verse goes. That I'm reading from. It says so will I go into the king. Which is not according to the law. You know not anyone to just go up to the throne. And the holy of holies. And just step in any old kind of way. That's the picture you see. And if I perish I perish. Look at the mindset that she had. If I perish I perish. If I have to die. For the sacrifice, I will die. Think about that. If I have to die, I will die. She was an example. She was willing to sacrifice her life for her people. It pictures, though, our Messiah's example in Matthew 4. So hold your place. Let's now turn to Matthew 4. I'm giving you pictures and symbolisms of why this book had to be written. It's a it's prophetic. It's for Yah's people for the last days. You understand? It has to do with the last days. And uh and that's why you have the ten sons of Haman that were hung then and a future fulfillment that happened in, in 1939 or so in Germany of ten of those leaders that were guilty of what they did to destroy millions of people's lives. 
So that's the fulfillment of that in the map in, in the last days, the pro prophecy though. So in Matthew 4, you know this verse. Look at what it says here, what the Messiah had to say. And I'm reading uh, from Matthew 4, beginning verse, let's see, 1. That's my place for a minute. Okay. No, verse 2. Verse 2. And when he had fasted, look at this example, 40 days and 40 nights. So to make sure it's understood, it's supposed, supposed to be a 24-hour a day. You understand? It's not just a daylight time. Or because what the darkness may picture has nothing to do with that. It's Yah's definition of what it constitutes a day. A day is a 24-hour period for mankind. So that's why it says day and night. 40 days he was afterward in hunger. Verse 3, and when the tempter came to him, he, he said, If you be the son of Elohim, command that these stones be made bread. And then he answered back in verse 4, but he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread, that's the physical part alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yah. Every word. Not what words that are convenient for us. Every word. And then also John 10. Let's turn there. I'm reading these scriptures of what the Messiah's example was. Just like Hadassah. And what she was willing to do. If I perish, I perish. Look what your Messiah was willing to do. And plan for it. In John 10. Looking at verse 15 as an example. John 10, 15. There's other scriptures too, but I'm just was led to this specific one. Verse 15 says, as the Father knows me, even so know I the Father. Now look what he says. And I lay down my life for the sheep. That's us. All that are called and chosen, you see, us for the sheep. It says, verse 16, and other sheep, not just the sheep of that day. He says, and other sheep I have in the future, which are not of this fold of that generation. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. That's by the Spirit. In the future, when they're given the Spirit, they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one. Look at this, fold, and one shepherd, one. We're all going to be reunited as one. We're not united now. We are divided as one. Verse 17, therefore, does my father love me? Her, Just like Hadassah, or willingness to lay down her life. And she was loved. It says, loved by the king is a picture of being loved by her husband. Okay? And loved by the father. It says in verse, uh, it says, therefore, um, verse 17, does my father love me because, because I lay down my life. Are you and I think about ourselves in our own conscious minds? You and I, are you willing to lay down your individual life for the purpose of why God selected you and handpicked you the father? And that the son did what he did for you and me individually. Think of what all this means. And especially now in these last days. This show, as it says here, I lay down my life and that I might take it again. Verse 18. No one, it says man, but in the Greek it can mean no one. That means man, meaning mankind or male and female. No one can takes it from me. I lay, but I lay it down of myself. I chose to do this. You understand? Of myself. I have power, which means authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it again. You understand? This commandment have I received of my Father. Wow. That's awesome. The kind of Savior that we have, who is teaching us now to have a certain kind of understanding. That's what this study is all about, part of it at least. So I read those verses.
And now uh, this is why Hadassah was chosen. I wrote my notes. Well, we're going back to Esther, of course. But in my notes, I said, this is was why Hadassah was chosen by Yah from her womb to picture from her birth, her birth name, to provide salvation. It's the picture of providing salvation. And it says, uh, of salvation from the enemy, away from the enemy, huh? which is Haman slash Satan. Satan possessed that man. Okay, Haman, that's the story. Now Esther 9. Let's turn there. Esther 9. I really believe with all my being the reason why we have now taken notice of the Feast of Pura. Didn't do it before. Think about our, our background necessarily. We kept all the feasts of Yehovah, yes. But our focus was never on the Feast of Pura. Think about that. Never, the something really didn't ever, ever come up all that much. Think about that. And why now? Why now? Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. It's amazing what Yah reveals. What he puts in our spirit to under, with understanding. Okay, so I said Esther 9, right? And uh, we're going to look at verse 24 and 25. Because I was addressing the fact, away from the enemy, Haman, Satan, 24 and 25, because Haman, verse 24, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Yehudas. You understand? The enemy of all the Yehudas and had devised against the Yehudas to destroy them. Who do you think was behind that? None other but Hasatan. All right? To destroy them. And then it says, and had cast per, P-U-R, and then it defines it, that is, the lot. The lot. To consume them and to destroy them. You understand? Consume them and destroy them. Verse 25. But when it says, Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that his wicked device, meaning Haman's wicked device, which he devised against the Yehudas, should return upon his own head. And that he and his sons, there you go. That's the prophecy. His sons should be hanged on the gallows. Now, previously in that chapter, all the way from verse 6 or so and thereafter, it names the 10 sons. But then they were hung, and then in the wording, it shows that there was a 10 to be hung in the future. And all those that have studied prophecy about this account understood that there was two sets of hangings. There was the hangings literally, biologically, so to speak, because there was, those were his biological sons. And then there was a spiritual application that happened in our day, in 1939. Hitler's Germany, you understand? And that's why it says what it says here in this account. Um, so it's, it shows that they were hung, and then it shows that there was a decree to hang uh, 10 more or 10 sons in the future. And that was verse 13. But that, that's, uh, we're not studying that right now, necessarily. I'm just re making reference. So let me continue. So that was verse 24 and 25 for our understanding. And I have here my notes. Uh, now we're turning to, let's see, verse 21. Verse 21. Going back now to verse 21. Notice this. It says to, this was to, the, this Feast of Purim, it was to establish among them, that's the Jews, that they should keep the 14th day of the month, Adar. Now that's the 12th month on the Hebrew calendar. All right, Adar. And then it says, and the 15th day of the same. And it says yearly. That's verse 21. So 
this was a feast that was established of that period of time. And now verse 17 and 18. Back, we're backtracking a little bit. Verse 17 says, And on the 13th day of the month, Adar, and on the 14th day of the same rested day. So 13 was when Haman was exposed. That's when he was exposed, the 13th. Okay. But it was on the, and then it repeats. It says, And on the 14th day of the same rested day, and they made it, a day of feasting and gladness. Verse 18. But the Yehudas that were at Shushan assembled together. Look at that. Yah has always talked to his people about an assembling. Assembled together on the 13th thereof and on the 14th thereof. And on the 15th day of the same, they rested. And they made it a, a feasting, a day of feasting and gladness. So now let's let's study this out. This word resting. Watch what this means. It's number 5117 and 5118 in the Hebrew. So 5117 and 5118, it's root. And the Hebrew word is nuwak. Nuwak. N U W. A C H, Nuwak, N U W, that's in the concordance section, A C H, 5117, 5118, and it says the meaning is uh, to settle down. This word resting now, we're studying that. As a blessing on a person, settle down, as a blessing on a person, house. Or family. Isn't that interesting? A blessing on a person or a house or a family to celebrate with praise. Believe it or not, Nuwak, it says, the word for resting now, that's how it's being applied, to celebrate with praise. Its root is of Noah, all right, Noah, you know, Genesis, which is number 5146. That's the name he was given from his birth, from his womb, Noah, which literally comes from this root of 5117-5118 as a resting to celebrate, though, to celebrate. And it says, Noah, so... It's of feasting. So now we're back to Esther in both verse 17 and verse 18 now. Esther 9, verse 17 18. The term of feasting, when it says about feasting, that's 4960 in the Hebrew. We've studied this stuff before. And the Hebrew 4960 is... Um, Meshe, Meshe is M-I-S-H-T-E-H, M-I-S-H-T-E-H, 4960. Now, this is defined as to drink. Think about that. To drink as in a special occasion. So they're told to do this, right? Feasting, okay? They're told to do this. It means to drink. As in a special occasion at a wedding. Isn't that interesting? At a wedding. So keep that in mind. Now, the next word is when it says feasting and gladness, the word gladness is number 8057. We've studied that word in times past, a Hebrew word, simcha. The Hebrew word simcha, S-I-M-C-H-A-H, -A -H, 8057. And this is the word that's used every time Yah's people kept the feast. Because it means joy. When it says gladness, it means it's translated in other scriptures as joy. Or, and then it says as a definition, 
rejoicing at Yah's festivals. Rejoicing at Yah's festivals. So it's a time, it's 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 a timing, this timing is a picture that is called Purim. It's called Purim. Its time is a picture called Purim that we see in these verses. And Purim in the Hebrew is 6332, 6332, or 6331, or its root, 6331, I'm sorry, and also 6333. Okay, so 6331, 6332, 6333. Okay, literally the word pure means to break. Pure. It also has the meaning to crush by lot. That's what pure means, by lot, to crush by lot in a wine press of grapes. In a wine press of grapes. Now we understand about the fall feast. That that third face is a picture of when it says the wine press that we read about in Revelation 18. Having to do with those that are not allowed to escape the tribulation. That's what that means. They're not allowed to escape the tribulation. The wine press of grapes. They're crushed. They're crushed to get them in the, in the tribulation to repent. To repent. So you got this feast called Purim that has associated with Haman and Satan, okay, because of what needed to be done to exterminate them. All right? And anyone that was like them. Anyone that was like them. So a picture's being saved by lot, though. Saved by lot. That's the meaning of Pur. And Pur is 1486. 1486. Well, look at verse 24 again. Look at verse 24. I should have had you look at that again. Because in the middle of the verse, he had devised against the Jews to destroy them. And then it says, and had cast Pur, P U R. And then it says, that is the lot. The lot. When it's casting per, it means the lot. And that word lot is 1486 in the Hebrew. Lot now, we're saying, by lot, casting of lots. 1486 is Gural. Gural is G O W R A L. Gural. 1486. This word lot now. Look at how this is defined. Small stones. For a, it says this in the Hebrew. Small stones for a purpose. Figuratively, a destiny. Small stones for a destiny. As if determined by lot, by the lot, which had to be cast, was cast to discover the will of Yah in a given situation. Let me repeat. It was as if to determ determine by lot, which was cast, to discover the will of Yah in a given situation. That's 14 days of Goral. And, and continue. This is the rest of the meaning. The idea was given of one's fate or destiny. So here you got a people that Yah designated that they would be designated as a destiny by Lot to be chosen by Lot. And uh, I'm thinking about it now, but in Acts, the, the first chapter, when um, uh, Judas had to be replaced. They cast lots. 
That's how Jews, and it, and it says, and Matthias was chosen. I believe it was. Matthias was chosen. And it was two that they could select from, and, it, and they cast lots. Looking for an answer from the Most High. So this happened hundreds of years before. And here you got in the days of the apostles, they're practicing the same thing. You understand? They understood the meaning. They were looking for a divine counsel to give an answer as to who should be chosen or not. Who should be chosen? And Judas had to be replaced. Judas had to be, just like Haman was replaced by Mordecai. All right. So that's the idea. It was given of one's fate or destiny. Now, when that happened, when I was reading these meetings, <laughs> right away I thought about, I said, well, isn't there a scripture that Peter wrote? That Peter wrote? And uh, and at first I thought it was in 2 Peter. I turned there, it wasn't there. And then I found it in 1 Peter 2. So let's turn there. Hold your place. Hold your place. And let's turn to 2 Peter First Peter. Oh. First Peter, so. Yes. Yeah. I turned. I I re repeated what I my mistake was when I turned the second uh, Peter, but it is First Peter. At least I know you're awake over there. Yes. Hallelujah. First Peter two. And look at these verses now. Think about the stones by lot and a destiny. All right, having to be looking for divine counsel as to who Yah is choosing. You understand? So 1 Peter 2 and look at verse 4. We start there. It says, to whom coming as to a living stone. Look what Peter is writing. Disallowed indeed of men though, rejected by men, but chosen of Elohim and precious. You understand? We're chosen. Verse 5, it says, you also as lively stones, our destiny as stones, are built up a spiritual house. You understand? A spiritual house, a holy or set-apart priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to who? To Elohim. By Yehoshua HaMashiach. We have to be acceptable in their sight. Verse 6, wherefore also it is contained, look what he says, in the scripture. He knew the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion or Sion a chief cornerstone, meaning about the Messiah. He's the headstone, the chief stone. It says, uh, chief cornerstone, elect. It says, precious as he always will be. And he that believes on him shall not be confounded. Now verse 7. But unto you, he's speaking to the brethren. He's writing to the brethren. Therefore who believe, he is precious. But to them which be, here we go, disobedient, like a Vashti, a false queen, or just like any other person, or just like Haman, just like Hasatan, you understand? And the demonic forces, which be disobedient, the stone, which the builders disallow, that is rejected, the same is made the head of the corner, the cornerstone of the building, of the temple, of the city. Verse 8, and a stone of stumbling, he's also a rock of offense, to them who stumble, well, how? At the word. You understand? They stumble at the word. That's why they're rejected. You understand? That's why they will not be allowed in the rapture. You understand? They will not be allowed to go in the rapture. That's serious. Being how? At the, they stumble at the word being disobedient. You cannot understand scripture when you are in disobedience. When you refuse to believe what's plain in the scripture, such as, you know, when the Sabbath is, as an example, and it's a full 24-hour day, or such as the virgin birth that you reject, or people out there that reject, you understand? 
or to reject the Gentiles and only make it a people of color. All of that, you see. They're disobedient, wherefore also they were appointed. They were appointed, allowed to go that direction. Yeah, I will let you go. You want to you disbelieve the scripture and his purpose and plan for all mankind? He'll let you go. You want to go that direction? He'll let you go. You understand? And then verse 9. But you, back to his people, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy or set apart nation, a peculiar, a special people, that is, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So people that reject scripture are in darkness. And that's why their lifestyle gets worse and worse and worse. That's what happens to them. It's sad. It's sad. What happens to people? Okay, so once again, who was writing this? Peter. I started to give the definition before, but then the Spirit showed me, well, follow your notes. I get sometimes too excited, and then I get, you know, messed up a little bit. But follow your notes. So why was Peter writing about stones? Let's turn to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. We were there earlier. Going back there now, Matthew 16. It's what the Messiah spoke to Peter. It's what he spoke. In verse 18, you know this verse, how many times we studied in the past. This is for our remembrance. This is for us to rehearse and remember. Verse 18 says, I and I also, uh, I say also to you, he's speaking. To Simon Barjona in verse 17. He answered, For context, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you, you are, we see in English, it doesn't have the impact unless you look up the meaning, unless you look up a name or whatever. And that word in the Greek is number four. Zero seven four in the Greek now four zero seven four. The Greek word is petros. P e t r o s. It's not a name. It's a title. It's a title, and literally it means a stone. Remember, he wrote about the lively stones. He understood that because he was given a ministry to represent a stone. Peter was, okay? Petrus, a stone when his birth name, I wrote here, was, it says here in the English, Simon, even in the Greek dictionary, Simon is number 4613. Simon, 4613. And guess what they put there? Its root is the Hebrew 8095. When you see the English spelling Simon, its root in Hebrew is 8095, and the Hebrew name is Simeon. Simeon, which was one of the sons of Yaakov and Leah. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Yehuda. He was the second born son, Simeon, of that story. And his name meant hearing. To hear. So he was called and, and given a name, Simeon Barjona, to hear the words of Yah. That was his destiny. Hearing, to hear the words, just like just like Leah wanted to be heard because her, her husband wasn't loving her in the right way, Yaakov. Yah had to correct that. So Simon. His name is Simeon, which means hearing. So my explanation, I say this to everyone. I believe. I want you to listen to me now. I believe the potential or possibility of the Feast of Purim is a deliverance by lot. It's a deliverance by lot. Looking at all the meanings that we've covered. It's a deliverance by lot. 
And it's on the 14th and the 15th of Adar. Look at those numbers. 14th and the 15th. So when I say it's 20. Uh, 5th, 26th of this month of February, whatever, coming up for 24, 25, forget now. The point is, the Hebrew calendar, it's the 14th day and the 15th day of Adar, which is the 12th month. Well, you know that the 12th month leads into the first month, right? So the interesting thing is, it's a month before Pesach. A month, exactly. On the 14th and the 15th, beginning the Feast of Pesach into Hagamatzah of unleavened bread. Same numbers, 14 and 15, okay? And it's by lot. A month before Pesach, the 14th and 15th of Nisan, or they call it Abib or Aviv, and the 15th, which is unleavened bread, Hagamatzah, which represents, think of it and understand this, it represents the Wedding supper of the Lamb. That's been known. That's been taught for years. And where do we get that? Luke 14. We've covered that numerous times. Luke 14. And so Luke 14, let's turn there. We can leave Matthew. Go to Luke 14. You know this set of verses. I may, may not read the whole thing, obviously. But just to reference Luke 14. Look what it said. And when you look it up in the Greek dictionary, for instance, that set of scriptures, guess what? They make reference to this statement when it says uh, in Luke 14, the Great Supper. The Great Supper, they know, knew and understood that was the Passover. The Passover. In the Greek dictionary, you can look it up for yourselves. And in fact, I, I've got 3173 as great. And the supper is 1173. You look up 11. It will refer to the Passover. So it was understood by the people of that time what that was to picture. And, and who was speaking this? If you ever read letters, the Bible or scripture, it's the Messiah that's teaching this. He was all about a future wedding, a future marriage. And that's why it says he made a great supper, verse 1, and obeyed, which is always at 2564, numerous times, which means to be called or to be invited. Many. He sent out a service, verse uh, uh, 17, at supper time to say to them that we're bidden. Bidden is the same, 2564, which means to be invited. Come, for all things are now ready. Verse 18, and they all with one consent began to make excuse, as we do as human beings. All of us are guilty, one degree or another. We make excuse. Make excuse. The first said to him, oh, well, I bought a piece of ground. I must know these go and see it. I pray you have me excuse. Verse 19. Another said, well, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I must go to prove or test them. I pray you have me excuse. And then another said in verse 20, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So here you're talking about three categories of people having to do with their work, their possessions and a relationship. And a relationship. And then verse 21. So that servant came and showed his master these things. And then the master of the house being angry. Yah gets angry. And we don't realize how much he gets angry. You know, we always want to talk about Yah. He's gentle. Yes, he's merciful. Yes, he's kind. Yes, he, he will give pity. All of that. But yet at the same time, he gets angry when the people that he sacrificed for laid out his life for, he blesses, he berukes us, and still will not believe, will not obey. We make excuse, and he is sick of it, and that's why he gets angry, and it says, and to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. Go get others. You, you don't want to listen? You want to make excuse? I'll choose somebody else. And what do you think has been happening in this ministry for the past 15, 16 years? People have been taken out because they refuse to believe the teachings right there in the scripture. And I get passionate about it, all right? And they're excusing themselves. Yah sees that, and they continue in that mode of thinking. And yes, we feast together, and we sit down together, and we love upon each other, and then all of a sudden they're gone. All of a sudden they're gone. They're removed. That's the wheat and the tares teaching. Verse 22, and the servant said, Lord, or master, it is done as you have commanded. And yet there's room. 
He's going to fulfill the 144,000, whether we understand it or not. It's coming to a completion now in our last day. Verse 23, and the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges. You know, I've studied this extensively. And that word is not an invitation. It says hedges and compel. That word, compel, means you get in their face and you command and you tell them straight whether they like it or not. That's what that means. If the opportunity allows for that. If it allows for that, you get in your fa their face and tell them. What, what's the worst thing they can do to you? Reject it? What's the worst thing they curse you? What's the worst thing they can do? Kill you even? Because that's going to happen too. They're going to kill some people of faith. That's what's going to happen. All right? That's going to happen too. So if you have to sacrifice your life, you sacrifice it. What Yah is saying. Compel them to come in that my house may be filled. House, once again, means the family. It means the temple. The city, the wife of the lamb. That's what that parable was all about, as well as Matthew uh, 22. That's the other scripture I had. Matthew 22, turn there real quick. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. I get passionate about this stuff. I can't help it. I keep my head in the scriptures. That's my life. You understand? Verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like to a certain king who made a marriage for his son. How plain can that be? The, the king is the father. The, the son is the Messiah. He made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call. That's 2564. To call, to invite. It says them that were bidden. 2564. They were invited. They were called to the wedding. That was on the our master, our Messiah's mind constantly. That's why he spoke about it so much. That's why he indicated it so much. It says, and they would not come. There you go. There's the rebellion. There's the disobedience. You see? And that's what's happened. Yet, I say this. Remember, I said to you, I wanted you to listen to my heart in explaining this. I said the potential or possibility. This forthcoming feast of Purim possibility, I said, because I wrote here in my notes, yet every feast can picture to be taken and saved, you see, from the tribulation, every feast, not just Passover and pay face, I can love and bread, not, uh, but also Shavuot pictures that, also the Feast of Trumpets pictures that, also the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippurim, that means to be one with the, our Creator in His presence, and we're fasting, and we're one. We don't need food or drink because we're already changed over. That is a picture. And then the Feast of Sukkot, having to do with his temple, having to do is being in his city. The Feast of And then, of course, Shemini Atzeret, when it's all finalized at the end, all the feast days picture that. That's why, that's why I said this Feast of Purim, which we never had a mind to be involved with before. But why not? Why not? Think, I say. I said, every feast is a picture of him sending his son to rescue, to take his bride to safety, to the father's house, city, dwelling place. We only need to believe, you and I, in faith, though, in faith in Yah's promises and have their works of righteousness. Because that's what he demands of us. So I wrote here when Josue gave those rapture type scriptures last Sabbath in reference to, I'll say, the Q&A time period for answers. And that's a good thing that he wants to know and understand these things. They fit into today's teaching to cover them or even what my son Joel, oftentimes he makes this reference to Shaul in the Shaul's Testament, the Testament, you see, the apocalypse in his writings, the Testament which I've given now the printouts. I've given you some printouts and we'll see how far this goes, you know, um, and uh, as to how far we go into the first session, 
versus the second session of the Q&A. So we may have to carry over some things into the Q&A. Okay. But the point is, we're going to now cover the teaching concerning the testament of Shaul. It's called, it be called the apocalypse, the vision of Shaul. Specifically, it's section 14 and 15. That's on the, the printout of it. But the pages are 9 through 11. So when I was looking it up, I thought about what we presented last Sabbath. I went online and I saw it was 47 pages. And then y'all reminded me because I was about to print out the whole thing. And he says, you've printed it out before. I said, you know what? You're right. I told the most I said, you're right. Let me go find it. And lo and behold, I went and looked in a few sections and there it was. I had previously, in previous studies, years back, I had already printed out that, that account. So we're in chapter 14 or whatever of that right printout. It's called the uh, Apocalypse. Let me see the original one. In fact, if you were to look up online, I don't know if you can see this, uh, the heading, it, it would say, here begins the vision of St. Paul the Apostle. Of Saint, because when you go online, you get all kinds of different uh, links. And you have to uh, get to the one link that shows this title. If you wanted to, to print out anybody online that wants to print this out, the whole 47 pages. Okay. Okay. It, it, it here begins the vision of Saint Paul the Apostle. Of Saint Paul the Apostle. And it's a fascinating read. You know, what is it? Second Corinthians uh, 12. Uh, it comes to me, Second Corinthians 12. I'll share this, this verse with you. What Shaul had to say. He, he was in a very important position used by the creator. And 2 Corinthians 12, he says uh, in verse 1, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1, it is not expedient or necessary or, you know, for me, doubtless to glory, the glory in himself. No man should do that, or woman for that matter. Glory in himself. I will come to visions. There it is. And revelations of Jehovah. No. And then he speaks in verse two, and he does it in the third person as if, you know, it's somebody else. It's really him. I knew a man in Messiah above or about 14 years ago. It's really him. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, you know, taking his soul out to, to go and see this, whatever. I cannot tell, he says. Yah knows, he says. Such a one was caught up. That's, that's 726. In the Greek, that's harpazo. The catching away. Which means to be taken up to the heavenly realm. Okay. I was caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, verse 3, whether in the body or out of the body, he keeps saying that, I cannot tell, but Yah knows. He, it says how that he was caught up. There it is again. 726, Harpazo, rapture. And it's sad that people won't accept it, but that's their choice. <laughs> Every individual choice. Okay. It says caught up into paradise. That's what he was given this vision. And heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. That's what he says. And he says in verse 5, of such a one will I glory yet of myself. I will not glory. Others will glory in their vanity, but not of himself. He says, but I would, I'd rather choose the glory in my afflictions. What I have to suffer sometime. All right, so now let's get into this. This page, I printed out these copies because 
I have notes, scriptures, and I wanted you to see what Yah was inspiring, what some of these words, I took the time, looked up in 1828 uh, Webster's Dictionary, I looked in the concordance as I searched out the meaning of some, because I don't speak like this, of vivification or something like that. I don't use words like that. You know, personally, I had to look this stuff up. You know, certain, certain uh, impious, for instance. I've never used the word impious, personally. That's not my tongue, my language for me. Other people use it. I, I don't know. I have to look up these words. So let me start on page nine. It says in verse uh, uh, 14th section, I indeed, when I had heard this sighed and wept and said to the angel, I wish to see the souls of the just, all right, and of sinners. It's two categories of people, the just, which, which means the righteous, and the sinners. Keep that in mind. And to see in what manner they go out of the body, that they go out of the body. It, excuse me, if she's being distracting here, uh, I don't she want to say something. No. Okay. Not. All right. No, okay. Just making sure. No, she's just breathing loudly. Something. Yes. All right. Even that is a distraction. She can't help it. She's, oh. She's a cold. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, she'll get better. And yeah. Oh, so it says, I wish to see the souls of the just and of the sinners and to see in what manner they go out of the body. I repeat. And it says, and the angel answered and said to me, look again upon the earth. So now he's up there. You understand? In paradise. Look again upon the earth. And I looked and saw all the world and men were as naught. And a wanting. Oh, I knew that the word a wanting means lacking. Okay, as an example. As not as nothing. Not means as nothing. And 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 a lacking. I looked carefully and saw a certain man about to die. And the angel said to me, This one whom you see is a just man, righteous. And I looked again and saw all his works, whatever he had done for the sake of Elohim's name and all his desires, both what he remembered and even what he did not remember. They all stood in his sight in the hour of need. Verse, and then continue. And I saw the just man advance. So now he's comparing both. You see, the, the just and the sinners. Okay. So I saw the just man advance and find refreshment and confidence. And before he went out of the world, the holy, now look at this, and the impious angels. So the holy are the righteous angels representing who? Our creators. But the impious, the meaning is profane and wicked. In the dictionary, when it says impious angels, they are the profane and the wicked angels. So we know then that's Satan's angels. All right? So both are, are, are in attendance. That's what I want you to see. Both types of angels are in attendance. It says, and it says right here, angels both attended. They attended. And I saw them all. Shaul was seeing this. But the impious found no place of habitation in him. No place, it says, the impious, it says, and I saw them all, but the impious, that's the wicked. Don't forget this. The wicked and profane angels saw no place of habitation in him, meaning the just man, the righteous one. But the holy took possession of his soul. That's the righteous angel. They took possession of his soul, guiding it, Till it went out of the body. That's what happens at death of a human being. Whichever one is the righteous human being or whichever one is the sinner. Both sets of angels are there. So either the righteous angel are, are going to have 
the judgment of Yah to take them up, the righteous, or the other side, the wicked, will take them down. You understand? They're waiting. All right. Think of it that way. So, but the holy took possession of his sword, repeat, guiding it till it went out of his body. And then it says, and they roused the soul, saying, soul, know your body whence you go out. For it is necessary that you should return to the same body. It's the reason why you see in your notes, type of body. Because we know by scripture, whatever the body that is deceased, it turns back to the dust. It decays. It's a corruptible body. Yah is not going to take a righteous soul and then they're, 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 they're righteous enough to be judged to be taken up and then bring them back in the same body that's corruptible. <laughs> no, because 2 Corinthians 5 says what it says, that there is a different tabernacle made in the heavens, not made with hands. And we've studied that a number of times, 1 through 8. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8. All right. So this is a different type of body. It says, on the day of the resurrection. So I wrote above that as first fruits. It's the first fruits that are being taken up. As for that you may receive the things promised to all the just. Whoever are the righteous are the just. So receiving, therefore, the soul from the body, they immediately kissed it as familiarly known to them. That's the righteous angels saying to it, do manfully for you have done the will of God, it says. The word manfully, I, didn't, I don't use that kind of, I don't say manfully about men or whatever. I don't speak that kind of language. I looked it up in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. It means boldly and honorably. So he's being instructed, this soul, do boldly and honorably for you, look at what is right, I underline here, have done the will of Yah, of Elohim, while placed in the earth. You've done the Yah's will, and there came to meet him, the angel, who watched him every day. Remember how you've been taught? You have angels. We have angels assigned to us from the time that we are in the womb. There are designated at least two angels, if not more, assigned to us. So it says here, to, to meet him, the angel who watched him every day and said to him, repeats it, do manfully, that is boldly and honorably, soul, for I rejoiced in you. You know, that's a good feedback from that righteous angel. I rejoice in you because you have done the will of Elohim on the earth. That's what was reported. For I related to Elohim. Now, the, uh, page 10. I related to Elohim. Remember? Everything is written. There's a report that goes up daily. Your works. I related to Elohim. Your works, such as they were. Similarly, also, now look at this, the spirit. Not just the angel. The spirit is a either a the human spirit, a recording device, or this is referencing the set-apart spirit. So similarly, also the spirit proceeded to meet him and said, now speaking to the soul, soul, fear not, nor be disturbed until you come into a place which you have never known. We're all birth. We're, we're brought into existence. We've never known the heavenly realm yet. You understand? We've never known it yet. But I will be a helper. That's what made me believe that it's a set-apart spirit because of what John 16 says. It's called a comforter, which means a helper out of the Greek. Perikletos is the Greek. But I will be a helper to you, for I found in you a place 
of refreshment. Once again, I didn't know what that meant. I don't use that kind of word. In the dictionary, it means strength. A place of strength, just like Hadassah. Name means, in the time when I dwelt in you. It's the set-apart spirit that has to live in us while I was on earth, meaning with you. And his spirit, you see, strengthened him. See, that's what the role of the set-apart spirit is all about. It strengthened him. And his angel received him. So you got the set-apart spirit and the angel. About the two witnesses. And let him into heaven. I circle that. Let him into heaven. The soul has to be taken up. And an angel said, now, when I saw this phrase, whither runnest thou? O soul, and do you dare to enter into heaven? Well, just to read it that way didn't make sense to me. So I had to look up these words. Whither? In, the, in that 1828 dictionary, it means to what place? So to what place, runnest, means to proceed or pass. To proceed or pass you. O soul, do you dare and dare has a positive connotation and a negative about daring. But in the sense of the context, one of the meanings is to have courage and strength of mind. My printing didn't, maybe didn't come out all that well, but courage and strength of mind to enter into heaven. So when you put this together, to what place do you proceed, O soul? And do you have courage and strength of mind to enter into heaven? That makes more sense with an understanding. Once again, to what place do you proceed, soul? And do you have courage and strength of mind to enter into heaven? Because that, that was a question, right? Wait and look at the rest of this in the context. Wait and let us meaning the angel and the set-apart spirit, let us see if there is anything of ours in you. That is, if to wait and see if there is a bad report. Because they report every day of ours in you. And behold, that's why they say, and behold, we find nothing in you. Nothing as a bad report in you. I see also your divine helper, that's the set-apart spirit, and the angel, and the spirit is rejoicing along with you because you have done the will, repeats it again, of Elohim on earth. And they led him along till he should worship in the sight of Elohim because we're brought in his sight. So look at this account. So far, what are we actually seeing? We're seeing that from the time of the Messiah all the way down to our day, when the Messiah went to release the righteous souls which were in Abraham's bosom, Luke 16, the righteous souls in Abraham's bosom, that they were released once again by our Savior and taken up. Taken up to the city. That's where the righteous souls go now. In the time of history before that, there was a gulf, a separation in the depths or caverns underneath the earth. And on one side was Abraham and the rich man, if you remember that story. And on the other side was not Abraham and Lazarus, I should say, on one side. And the other side was the rich man that was in torment. All right. So keep that in mind as we are continuing with this. So then it says, and they it says when they said they led him along till he should worship in the sight, because he's in the presence. In the sight means you're in the presence of Yah. So and when they had ceased, immediately Michael, there you go. Who is he that we read about in Yermiahu? Or Daniel, I should say, in Daniel 12, he's the prince that stands for the children of his people. Okay, 
So Michael and all the army of angels that he's in charge of, the righteous angels, with one voice adored the footstool of his feet of the righteous soul and his and his doom, his ending, saying at the same time to the soul, this is your Elohim of all things who made you in his own image and likeness. That's Genesis from which every human being is to be made in the image and likeness of our creators. Moreover, the angel returns and points him out saying, Elohim, remember his labors. For this is the soul whose works I related to you. All his life, the works written down on tablets and sent up and brought up to the throne, doing according to your judgment though. And the spirit said likewise, I am the spirit of vivification. And I looked up that word. It means to give life. So I am the spirit to give life, inspiring him. See that now it makes sense to use the term to give life rather than this long word. Inspiring him to give life. For I had refreshment in him. Well, that word refreshment. I looked it up in the dictionary. It means relief and strength in him. For I had relief or strength in him in the time when I dwelt in him. The set apart spirit. I dwelt in him doing according to your judgment, thy judgment. And there came the voice of Elohim and said, inasmuch as this man did not vex me. All right. The word vex in the dictionary means to irritate or anger. To irritate or anger, yeah, neither will I vex him, <laughs> he says. For according as he had pity, though, I also will have pity. Let him therefore be handed over to Michael. It says it again. The angel, look at this, of the covenant. Our relationship has always been designed in, as a covenant relationship. He's the angel of the covenant. And let him lead him into paradise. That's where they are. From Adam all the way down. The, only the individuals that were righteous are there now. And that's where my wife is. I, I know that out of faith. Not out of just hope, but out of faith. And, and strong belief based on the scriptures. That's where she is and others like her that came out of this life, you see. And let him lead him into paradise. It says, oh, it says a paradise of joy, though, that he himself may come or become, I should say, co-heir with all the saints. So describing it, a righteous man. So as he's being taken to join with as a co-heir with all the saints. And that's why I put of the 144,000. Of the 144,000 with all the saints. And after these things, I heard the voices of a thousand thousand angels and archangels and cherubim. And as soon as I saw 24 elders, I immediately thought about Revelation 5. Y'all put that in my spirit. So I turned to Revelation 5. Let's turn it. Revelation 5. You know how many times we had to read that section because Johanan was taken up also, like Shaul was. To see things in the heavenly realm that we read about. And so Revelation 5, we're reading in verse 8 through 11. Look at this. Revelation, when he had taken the book, that's the Lamb, the Messiah. The four beasts, it says, which means living creatures, okay? Uh, and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb having every one of them harps and golden vials full of the odors, which are uh, typified of the prayers of the saints. Verse 9, and they sung a new song saying, you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to Elohim by your blood out of every kindred, out of every tongue or language and people and nation or race. And you have made us to our Elohim kings, and I put slash many times in my study, and queens. It's not just about the male gender, kings, queens, and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. 
Now verse 11. Here's the key verse. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels, multi means multitude of angels, round about the throne and the beast or the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands of thousands. Look at that, what it says here. Saying with a loud vo voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing or baruching. And that's why I use that verse, set of verse, because he said, Shaul was writing this. I heard the voices of a thousand thousand angels and the archangels. That's the living be creatures that is in, in, in the English, they put the word beast. They're not beasts, they're living uh, angelic uh, beings that are the cherubim. And the cherubim and the 24 elders. Now I can turn the page to page 11. Then they were saying hymns and glorifying Yehovah and crying, you are just, O oh Yehovah, and just are your judgment. And there is no acceptance of persons with you that is to be with you, but you rewardest to every man or woman according to your judgment. And the angel answered and said to me, have you believed and known that whatever each man of you has done, he sees in the hour of need to see it. And I said, yes, sir. Now, section 15. And he said to me, look again down on the earth and watch the soul of an impious man, which means profane and wicked, profane and wicked, that kind of man. Listen to this, going, now here's the description, going out of the body, who or which vexed Yehoah day and night, irritated, made him angry. That's what vex means, saying, I know nothing else in this world. I eat and I drink, look at the mindset, and enjoy what is in the world, the pleasures of life. What is in the world, for who is there who has descended into hell? No, you don't believe? You don't believe in the doctrines and the teachings that are revealed in the scripture that there is a hell. So who has descended down in hell or as ascending has declared to us on the earth that there is judgment there. That is a doubtful, dis disbelieving individual that there's judgment. Oh, you don't believe in the judgment? Okay, you'll see. You'll see. And again, I looked carefully and saw all the scorn of the sinner. And all that he or she did. And they stood together before him in the hour of need. And it was done to him in that hour in which he was threatened out of his body at the judgment. The soul threatened out of his body at the judgment. And I said, it were better for him if he had not been born. Just like the scripture says. That we were studying in James, I forget now, or Peter. When it says, after you have known the holy commandment. It's better to, if you have known it and then to reject it than to be born. Something like that. I'm not necessarily quoting it exactly. And after these things, I continue. There came at the same time the holy angels. See the difference? And the malign. That the word malign means viol violent hatred or enmity. Malign, that word malign means violent hatred or enmity. You know what Shaul wrote? You know, those that reject the, the law or the Torah are enmity against Yah? Against? So the malign, it says the holy angels and the malign. So there's two separate classes, two separate groups. It says, and the soul of the sinner. It says, so the malign and the soul of the sinner. And then it says, and the holy angels did not find a place in it. So they couldn't take that soul. Did not find a place in it. Moreover, but the malign angels, that's the, once again, the, and it has another meaning I wrote there, uh, means evil to others. They practice evil to others. The malign angels cursed it. Cursed that soul. You understand? And when they had drawn it out of the body, that's the malign angels, drawn it out of the body, the angels admonished it a third time, saying, O wretched soul, look upon your flesh whence you came out. That's before they're taken down. You see, look upon your, 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 your flesh, uh, your body, that is, 
that you came out. Um, for it is necessary that you should return to your flesh in the day of resurrection. It's not the same resurrection. That's why I put Daniel, Yah, let me to Daniel 12, verse 2. Turn there. It's not the same resurrection. It's a different resurrection. And Daniel, who's involved in this vision, because he's the covenant angel of Israel, but in Daniel 12, you know this verse. Verse, I said, I said verse two, but here's about Michael. Here's about Michael. Verse one, and at that same time, Michael stood up the great prince who stands for the children of people, not die, die is not in the original Hebrew, indicating it's just about Israel, no, of people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as was not, never was since there was a nation to that same time. And at that time, People shall be delivered. Everyone that has been found written in the book. Verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some. Look at that word some. Not all. To everlasting life. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's two separate classes of people. Two separate judgments. All right, the righteous and the unrighteous. You see, the, the righteous and the wicked. Separate, the wicked is separated from the righteous. So now, I repeat this back on this page, page 11, where it says, it says, you shall, that you should return to your flesh in the day of that resurrection, which means of contempt. That's at the end of the thousand years, when they're brought back, back in a human body of flesh and blood. Okay, that you may receive the due for your sins and impieties. Now, that's a different word, impieties. I don't use that kind of language. It means disobedience. You say due for your sins and impieties. It means disobedience to commands and authority. Look at that. Look how they're being judged as a result of their kind of mindset. Now, page 12 final page. And when they had let it forth, verse, this is section 16 now, the customary angel preceded it and said to it, O wretched soul, I am the angel belonging to you, relating daily to Yehovah your malign works. You see that? Your works of disobedience, your works that are wicked. You understand? Your works daily, whatever you did by night or day. 24-7, angels don't sleep. <laughs> no, 24-7. And if it were in my power, not for one day would I minister to you. I had to observe your actions and then write these things down. And he says, but none of these things was I able to do. The judge is pitiful and he is just. And he, I circle that, himself commanded us, that is the angels, that we should not cease to minister to your soul. See how merciful Yah is, and even in that, while they're still alive, to minister till you should repent. They've had, that, that's why I said there's no excuse when people die. When people die, till you, that, till you should repent. But you have lost the time. There's a cutoff. You have lost the time of repentance. I indeed was strange to you and you to me. They didn't believe they were being watched, <laughs> thinking they didn't get away with anything. Let us go on then to the just judge. I will not dismiss you before I know from day, for, from today, why I was strange to you. Now here's the judgment. And the spirit, that's the wicked spirit though, confounded him. And the angel, that's the evil angel, troubled him. When therefore they had arrived at the power, when he started to enter heaven, a labor, because we all come before the judgment seat. Remember? Shaul wrote that? Every human being before the judge, A labor was imposed upon him above all other labor. And that labor was error, oblivion, which is darkness, and murmuring met him. All the things that he did, the spirit of fornication, 
that met him, that was exposed, in other words, and the rest of the powers, and said to him, whither you go, wretched soul, and dare you to rush into heaven? No, hold, that we may see if we have our qualities in you, the qualities of righteous character, since we do not see that you have a holy helper. You don't have the set apart spirit. That's why they go down. You don't have the holy helper. And after that, I heard voices in the height of heaven saying, present that wretched soul to Elohim, that it may know that it is Elohim that is despised. Your lifestyle, your manner, your mindset was despised against Yah. When therefore it had entered heaven, all the angels saw it as witnesses. In other words, a thousand thousand exclaimed, exclaimed with one voice, all saying, woe to you, wretched soul, for the sake of your works, which you did on earth. What answer are you about to give Elohim when you shall have approached to adore him? You think you could just, you know, just honor him with words? You know, like it's taught in Christianity, you know, praise and all this and singing and all that. No, it's your works. The angel who was with it answered and said, weep with me, my beloved, for I have not found rest in this soul. And the angels answered him and said, let such a soul be taken away from the midst of ours. There's that separation for from the time he entered. I won't enter it in because that goes on to page uh, 13, and I didn't want to copy that as a part of this study. So I share all of that in that writing because the scriptures, all of this supported what Josue's questions are about those verses that pertain to and about the rapture. We may cover that in the Q and A, so to speak, and uh, as a continuation, um, as I relate those verses, because this writing of the vision of Shaul in Paradise supports what that doctrine is all about to be taken up. Why there is a taken up, a removal from the earth of the soul. Now that goes up. It used to go down in a certain part of the earth, you know, in peace, you see. But now it automatically goes up if you're righteous. And there's only a select number that's going up. That's what we need to understand. So I'm going to end this part of our teaching for today. And I'm going to go, you know, five minutes, 10, 10 minutes, whatever it takes. Take a break. We go into Q and A, and get into the continuation of what we were discussing, of what we were discussing, and especially on those rapture verses that Josue referred to last Sabbath. Those are all, all those verses we've covered a number of times, but we need reminders. We need to remember, and we need, you know, some kind of an explanation of how we need to believe that. How we need to accept that. Because Yah knows. Yah knows every human mind and heart. So let us pray. O Most High Father, once again, we give you praise and honor and glory. It's not of any man or woman to glorify. Because knowledge puffs up. But it is love that edifies. And so we need to love and to give of ourselves to you our Father and our Creator and our Designer and to give of ourselves to your Son, Yehosha, our Savior, our Redeemer, and who bought and paid for us with his shed blood. And we need to accept that sacrifice. But we ourselves have a responsibility. We ourselves have a responsibility to worship you in your spirit and by your words, not ours, not the way that we think about matters of life. We have to always, always seek your counsel and always seek it through the spirit, always seek it through prayer and fasting when it's necessary, all of those things. And we're asking you, Father, for your blessing on us as living souls, though, 
that we are to be made worthy to escape what is going to come. And it may, have, may come sooner than we expect. Only you know that. Only you, Father, can decide that for each sets of feastings or feast days that come forth. But we just look to you now, uh, whatever food that has been eaten for your blessing on that and whatever food that will be eaten as we uh, when we close the Q&A. But we ask your blessing and we'll ask it again or ask it again later on as well. It's never too many times to give thanks to you and to glorify your name. So we ask your dismissal temporarily and we ask your blessing when we come back to go into whatever questions that are necessary and hopefully to get some answers. And we depend on you for that. In the name, though, of our Savior, Yehosha, hallelujah. hallelujah. So I'll end this stream for now. And then we'll come back five or ten, whatever time it takes.